Yeah. So are we good to go? We just barely have quorum, but we do have quorum. Oh, okay. So I, I will call the May 27th, 2022 meeting to order. And we have just heard certification of quorum, correct? Yeah. Yes. So I have a few, few. so welcome everyone. Uh, I have a few remarks today. Uh, I wanna congratulate Samantha Lawson. She's been reelected to the 2022 Conservation Ontario Board of Directors for a third term. Congratulations, Sam. And we look forward to your work in that role. And you know, I always believe that these organizations, the, the more we do, the better we are, whether you're joining AMO or FCM or getting involved in Conservation Ontario it gets us a seat at the table and, and it matters. So. Thanks for the extra work doing that, Sam. It's appreciated. Second one, uh, Nancy Davey. I'm sad to announce the Director of Resource Management is retiring from her role with the GRCA. Over the past 35 years, Nancy has influenced how conservation authorities deliver planning and permitting processes, develop strong and critical relationships with all levels of government, and had a positive impact on the people who have worked with her. Please join me in thanking Nancy for the incredible contribution she has made over a time at the GRCA. We wish you well in retirement. And I'm not sad you're getting a retirement. It's just sad to, sad to see you go, Nancy. You want to say hello or goodbye? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll say hello and goodbye, yes. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been on one of these calls. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thanks very much, Chris. And uh, I do want to say hello and goodbye. Uh, it's been a great honor to work for the GRCA for 35 years. And I, I did a quick tally. I was, I've been attending these board meetings for uh, 25 years and electronic record wise, that's about 825 board reports. <laughs> so so I, I was gonna do a Dwight graph, but I didn't get that far. So, <laughs> uh, but I do wanna say, I, I know that the board has shown a lot of leadership um, over the years and will continue to do so. But, and how much, uh, very much appreciate support the board on resource management programs and the staff at the GRCA. I know you're in good hands with the board and the management committee and the staff at the GRCA. So it's been a, a great run. Thanks so much. All right, Nancy, thanks very much. And congratulations again. So I would ask- Just if I may, please. just for a second, uh, Nancy, you and I go back oh, over sorry. 25 years. And um, Nancy's always been, oh, she's done an amazing job reporting to the board but she's a great people person and a great negotiator between conflicting bodies. And um, so we've, we've dealt with a few situations uh, with Nancy and really appreciate your work and well-deserved. And how can it be that you're retiring? I'm sure we're only 25, 30 years old, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Both of us, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Now, listen, we don't want to start spreading disinformation. Um, so. So Lisa, sorry, next, anybody, sorry, I should have asked. Is any, so any other comments? All right, thanks, Nancy, that's great. Lisa, hello, welcome. I, um, on May 24th, Lisa Keys will be assuming the director's role. Lisa has a diverse professional background with over 15 years experience in facilities operations management and in, public, and in the public sector, specializing in strategic planning, capital and operating budgets, health and safety and legislative compliance. Welcome, Lisa. Welcome to the team. Chair, did you say 50 years? I say 15. Oh, thank you. I thought, no way. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining the team. Uh, and finally, starting Chair, on May 3rd. Sorry? Chair, if I may. Please. Sorry, Catherine. Yes, that's okay. Um, Lisa's laughing because she just left the city of Cambridge against our will. But uh, the, uh, the good thing is she's here and landed well, and I'll still get to see her, but we will miss her at the city of Cambridge. So GRCA was certainly the, uh, the benefactor in her, her move here, but welcome, Lisa. All right. So much, Mayor McGarry. Thank you. Okay, so finally, starting on May 30th, Pippi Ruth, Pippi Warden Burton, will be assuming the director's role for the water management division. Pippi has over 20 years experience in water resource engineering and has specialized in hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, urban flood mitigation, stormwater management design, and sewer network modeling. At the June meeting, we'll get a chance to introduce the board to Pippi. So congratulations to her as well. Okay, thank you for that. So now moving right into the agenda. 
I have a motion that the agenda for the general membership meeting be approved as circulated, moved by John, seconded by Joe. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing and hearing none, I have a motion that the minutes of the general membership meeting of April 22nd, 2022 be approved as circulated, moved by Richard, seconded by Ian. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Zipping right down to uh, 12.1, Conservation Authorities Act, overview of phase two regulations. I'll just turn it over to you, Sam. Sure, or, uh, th yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just, sorry, just a, a report on the phase two regulations. So these are the final set of the regulations that um, were coming out from MECP. So they, again, the phase two regulations are more to deal with um, the levy, updating the levy regulations. There was a transparency regulation, which is basically um, requires the authority to put all of our governance information under one heading on the website so that it's easily accessible to anybody who's looking for it. Um, we also have a new fee policy that will come into play and it supersedes the um, fee policy, the previous fee policy that the minister had provided. It's actually a much broader um, fee structure. So from that perspective, it's, uh, it's nice to see. And then just as another highlight as well, um, with these regulations coming out, it concludes the Ontario Working Group. Um, so that has wrapped up as well. And just also, I know um, through other reports, I've been updating that the Section 28 regulations or development regulation, which is managed by the Ministry of Natural and Resources, Forestry, Mining, I'm the long acronym, I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head what all the, the letters stand for, but basically the old MNR, um, they still have not um, come forward with the updates to the regulation. And we're actually anticipating that we probably won't see any of the updates to that regulation for at least <coughs> six to 10 months. So just to, I know that's one that a number of external agencies are, are interested in, and there will be a lot of interest around it when that happens. But the province has still indicated that they're interested in updating um, our Section 28 regulation. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right. Thank you. Uh, clearly a continuing work in progress. Any comments or questions from the board at this point? All right. Uh, yep. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. No, I'm sorry, proceed with this and then I'm wondering if we can go back and receive the correspondence, please. Oh, of course. Uh, well, I haven't put this motion on the floor yet, so let's just receive the correspondence, sorry. Can I get a motion to receive the correspondence? Moved by Jerry, seconded by Sue. Comments or questions? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Good, all right. So I have a motion that the Motion that report number GM 052245 overview of phase two regulations be received as information. Moved by John, seconded by Jane. Anything further? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. So uh, return to in-person board meetings. There's several options here, well, three, I guess. Um, it's all in the report. Did you wanna to speak to it, Sam or Karen? Uh, uh, certainly, Chair Witt, yes, we, um, to sum it up, what we're asking at this point is because um, our auditorium where we hold board meetings, um, it's a multi-purpose room, so it's not set up for just for purely for these meetings. So uh, instituting a, the new technology to accommodate a virtual or hybrid meeting is a little more complicated. We have a few other factors to consider there. Um, so we're asking if we could continue with the current, or we're recommending that we continue with the current practice of virtual meetings for now, and that staff report back when we have more specific information about the technological solution that will be required. We're still at the meeting with consultant phase. The acoustics in the auditorium present some challenges for us, so we're trying to work through some options there. All right. Um... So we'll go around and ask. Okay, so Joe, do you have a question? Yeah, just 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 very quickly. Uh, we had our first uh, uh, in-person hybrid uh, 
council meeting this past week and it just worked perfectly. It was so slick. We had the Zoom people on and, and the delegations were able to speak. Um, it was clear. Uh, it it it's really would be my preference. I know there's going to be a little bit more uh, research into the cost of this, but uh, by all means, if, uh, if that opportunity presents itself, I would highly recommend it. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Okay, Joe, thanks. Kevin? Yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't like to uh, boast, but uh, we at City of Brantford have been doing hybrid meetings for the last six months. And you know, there's no question, it's, it's a bit of a rocky road. And when you come out of the gate with a hybrid meeting, it's never perfect. It's, it's a work in process. And I think most people understand that. And, you know, I feel having, having the benefit of hybrid meetings, I feel quite strongly that we should move to it and move to it as quickly as possible. The, these virtual meetings, I mean, they're very convenient, but I call them one dimensional meetings. You, you miss something in terms of being able to ask staff questions before the meeting, which is much easier to do if it's in person. Just the, the personal contact between board members, having the open meeting, I think results in a kind of a more cohesive board and probably a better informed board. I think a stronger board in terms of how it acts and, and how it can carry out uh, directions to staff. So the problem with the recommendation to us is just too open-ended and it doesn't, if you, if you don't give staff a definitive goal, um, then it, uh, it will be delayed. And I think we should do that. I think we should uh, direct staff that we'd like to have a, a hybrid meeting format in place for September and wow. realizing that that is a challenge, but you know, all the way through COVID, staff and all of many organizations have been challenged, but they seem to rise to the occasion. And I'm going to put that on the floor that we move to a virtual hybrid format, pardon me, an in-person hybrid format, uh, starting with the meeting in September, seeking a seconder. Okay, um, seconded by Brian. Uh, I thought it might be appropriate though to, to, I mean, we can deal with that motion now or go around the room and then come back to your motion. You all right with that? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, you're dropping something right at the beginning before everybody's had a chance to say hello, but that motion yeah. is now on the floor. Everybody understand that? We've got a hybrid motion. So just so we're clear, you're, well, we'll clarify when we get back. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Catherine? Thanks very much. And uh, the city of Cambridge is moving to a hybrid model. Our challenge has been um, the shortage and supply of chips in the world. So we would have been already up and running if uh, the supply chain had allowed us to have all the equipment in place. So we are going to a hybrid meeting just as soon as possible, but just um, I would be reluctant to put a date on it because um, we may not be able to achieve that date because of the uh, issues. The statistics that we took during uh, COVID means that there is actually more engagement from our public during our um, hybrid meetings, partly because uh, people can just call in rather than sometimes having to get a babysitter or try to arrange to travel or they don't have a car or whatever. We have actually seen an increased uh, public participation, but I would just caution that we ordered our equipment last year and we're still waiting for some of the pieces to continue to bring in the, uh, the hybrid uh, model. And the other thing that we'll have to do once we do get it in place is do some, some training uh, for staff and as well as council before we get going. So I'm happy to support a hybrid meeting, but I would uh, probably change to say as soon as possible, just because we don't know when the supply chain issues are gonna resolve. Thanks. Thank you. Sue? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we've been hybrid for the last month, hugely successful as you stated. But you're right, there's a supply issue. You also have to think of the size of the auditorium and the sound and the acoustics because there's nothing worse than trying to do a hybrid meeting when the acoustics don't work. So staff do have a challenge. That being said, um, I think they really should aim for September like Kevin's uh, uh, motion states because in that amount of time, we should be able to pull it together. And they've got a lot of work to do because it is such a big space and there is the sound issue and other things. So um, yeah, I think we should get moving on it for uh, September attempt based on supply and everything else. We didn't have the supply problem. Um, we were able to get everything we needed right away. So that was a good thing. And we've again, found them hugely successful. 
Thanks, Sue. Richard? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, as Kevin had said, we've been hybrid at, at City Council for quite a while, but it's still not working well. Uh, speakers are still not working. Microphones are still not working. Cameras are still not working as they should. So uh, we need to get it right. But I hopefully, hopefully, we've learned something from the pandemic and from the ability to do Zoom meetings in the first place. The accessibility for those that can't travel, for those that are concerned about climate change that want to drive to a meeting just to drive to a meeting. And, and, and the idea that somehow we can't relate to each other unless we can touch each other's bodies by shaking each other's hands or patting each other's back uh, is quite, quite frankly to me ridiculous. Um, we can share how we think uh, very easily uh, visually over Zoom. Chairman, and, point of order, point of so order. I think that's okay. fine that we can- uh, oh, wait, Point sorry. of order. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Yes, Kevin. Simple point of privilege. Uh, it's it's unparliamentary to say that the arguments made by other members are ridiculous. Uh, calls for an apology. I did. I apologize. I didn't say that you said anything that was ridiculous. Actually, there's the apology. Go ahead, Richard. Finish okay, off. Okay. So uh, the the fact that we uh, we we can meet with each other and we can work together quite well without being on Zoom works very well, and it has worked. At our council, we've got a couple of members of council that don't attend council and they were very efficient. <laughs> we haven't any problems. So I'm hoping that we learn something from the pandemic and don't think we have to rush back to be in meeting. I think a, a hybrid meeting is a good approach going forward for making it accessible to everyone. So I, I won't be supporting uh, a mandate that says we've got to do it by September when staff are saying we've got to hire a consultant. We've, there's a cost between $100,000 and $150,000. I think uh, Catherine's idea that as soon as possible, Works fine, thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. Jane? I'm muting the downside of Zoom. Okay, <laughs> talking with your mute on. Anyway, um, yeah, I agree with uh, Catherine that we should make it as soon as possible. I did have a question. In the report, it said that only 20 people were allowed in the boardroom at this time. So how does this hybrid work Do the rest of us? Are we like in the science fiction movies where we have a little TV where our desk is and there's our, our picture? Or how does it work? That's what I want to know. Sure, uh, through you, Chair White. So that, that is one of our issues right now is that we have, as an employer, we have certain protocols in the workplace for health, from a health and safety perspective. And so we've determined the capacity of our auditorium to be about 20 people so that we can still have some larger training sessions in the auditorium and have people physically distanced. So the challenge with our large number of board members is that the current format of the horseshoe table um, doesn't allow for physical distancing. And if we were to make a bigger horseshoe, then you know, that also creates challenges for us with our existing speaker system um, and it exceeds the capacity that we've set. So we are looking to increase the capacity of the room in the near future. It's not quite at the level of the full board. So, um, that is a consideration uh, why we're recommending a, a slightly delayed implementation for this as well um, from a COVID safety perspective, but also just the, the challenges of having a multi-purpose room for our board meetings. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder if the mover and seconder are okay with a friendly amendment to just make it as soon as possible, or do they well, still want to stick with September? Let's let's well, get through the room, Jane, and then we'll refine the motion. Is that all right, Kevin? I'll make yeah. a amendment. I, I am prepared to make propose a friendly amendment, but uh, I'm okay. quite happy and content to wait. So. We'll figure out a way to get both as soon as possible in September in there. How about that? Um, yes, I was going to suggest that it read that staff make their best efforts right. to, Some... to implement a, a hybrid meeting format by the by September. Yeah, if possible, something like that. Can, yeah. Karen, can, can I ask a question? Uh, sorry, I don't mean to interject myself here. The COVID protocols in terms of distancing, is there an expectation that this is going to be forever? I certainly hope not. Okay. Um, uh, you know, we're just, we're taking a very methodical approach okay. to trying to manage COVID in the workplace. I think that um, we've, we're monitoring other workplaces, uh, the type of practices that they do there, and we're just really trying to be mindful of our own staff safety. And okay. large groups in particular, we, we have a lot of people in safety sensitive positions and you know, one, one person does this job 
Um, and we need our people to be safe and healthy. So we're really trying to minimize exposure as much as we can. Makes absolute sense. Just just wanted to, to clarify that. Because again, right, we you've got one person, if, if half the staff go away on COVID, we, we won't be able to function. Okay, Ian, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair White, through you. My preference would be to continue with option two, the virtual meetings, but I would certainly support the hybrid. Uh, my reasons are the environmental factor, the distances that some of us have to travel and um, pollution. Uh, also the cost factor in terms of the money we're saving by continuing with uh, virtual. Uh, also um, looking at the convenience factor. It only takes me 10 minutes to come downstairs, set up my Zoom and away we go, as opposed to spending time in a car to travel for an hour and a half meeting. So if you're trying to schedule other meetings around this one, it can sometimes be challenging. So my preference is option two, or I will support option three. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Warren? Thank you, uh, Chair Wright. You can see my picture this morning. <laughs> it's the best picture I've seen of you. Well, that's the best it's going to get today, I think. Um, I like the virtual meetings because you can be there in, per in person. Right now, I'm having technical difficulties, and that's why you can't see me this morning. Um, I understand the people coming from a distance and those issues, cost factor with the price of gasoline, but maybe we could get everybody an electric car, and they could just zip up back and forth from their home to the meeting. Um, but I, I like the in-person one personally. Uh, but I would live with the hybrid if we had to go that way. Thank you. Right. Warren, thank you. Uh, John? Uh, thanks, uh, Chairman. Uh, I, I agree with Warren's comment about in person. I, I favor that. Uh, a lot of municipalities have moved back to that now uh, across the province of Ontario, and for good reason. Uh, it is somewhat uh, a bit of an anti-democratic kind of of scenario that we sit in. Uh, you know, we we don't have access to staff the way we do, or access to one another, and and uh, and I think that's what's been missing. Quite frankly, I think we've operated very well generally, but uh, I think we do need to get back together again. I think that it's also time for uh, a review by GRCA staff of of their protocols uh, because uh, again, it's being done in other municipalities and. You know, I, I recognize the issue when you've got uh, exposure with, you know, a person who has responsibility. Uh, but I think that, you know, people are taking uh, personal responsibility for their health. Uh, that's probably not the issue it was uh, even six months ago. Uh, I, I support uh, Mayor Davis's uh, uh, motion. Um, and I, I am supportive of, of where uh, the team wants to go in terms of, of uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and I hope that, that that as quickly as possible is September. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Right. Sue, are you back up? Yes, sir. There's a few things we haven't thought of or, I, or haven't, you just brought them to mind. Um, number one is that, yes, I, I think we should be coming back into person. But there has to be a set of standards, uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of code of conduct type thing. We've made it at our township where counselors have to attend unless they are sick or weather related. Now with the distances on GRCA, I think staff should maybe even look into a rotation basis for some of them that are distances away so they can, uh, or, or look at the different possibilities we can examine for attendance. The other thing was um, the social distancing. At our council meetings, we've gotten the little clear petitions between ourselves. They just sit on the desk, they're little uh, clear stands, and um, they, they allow us to be closer together and yet still allow some comfort for uh, protection. So I think that would be easily related. I, don't, I think that the 20 rule, as um, some of us had said, it's time to move forward. It's time to live with COVID and um, doing it as best as we can and realistically. So again, there's going to have to be, this committee or staff is going to have to present uh, a method of attendance, what will be allowed and what won't be allowed. Because now I've got councillors that are traveling all the time and don't want to bother coming to council meetings. And we've basically said, we've made a rule that you can miss meetings if you're sick or the weather's bad. 
but otherwise you have to attend that's your due diligence. And we do have a due diligence as representatives of our municipality, but the frequency because of distances and other things have to be looked into as well. And also to address COVID issues, not rather than still implement as if we are following all the regulations of masking and social distancing and everything else. So I agree with uh, the September time or best, best uh, as we can, but there's a lot of things staff still have to look into to make it workable. And we have to bear responsibility as well. Thank you, Sue. Um, Kevin, I, I, I'll, I'll get to you. I think you're last. So I'm gonna save you for last if John's got one more comment here. Sorry, you're muted. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't. I'm sorry, I left oh, my okay. hand by mistake. Apologies. No problem at all. Uh, sorry, one sec here. Um, yeah. So, Kevin, you're going to, uh, I think we're going to get back and put your motion on the floor. Can I just want to do that? And I'm, then I just want to make a couple comments and then we'll, sure. we'll, we'll call the question. Do you, why don't we just be absolutely clear? Your motion is going to be. Yes, my, I, I'm very happy to provide clarity. So my motion would be, uh, and I guess I'm withdrawing the other one, or if uh, <coughs> if okay. Councillor Coleman will agree to a, uh, Coleman will agree to a change. Anyways, what, what I'd like it to say is uh, the board directs that staff make their best efforts to achieve a hybrid meeting format for the September board meeting. It gives... Uh, seeking a seconder, I guess, for that one. So, Brian, are you all right with that? Sorry, I'm just going to go back to the original, if that's okay. You good with that, Brian? Yes, I am. Uh, and i like to speak to it at the time. Sure. Karen, are we okay with this? Yes. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Kevin, I'll, and then I'll get you, Brian. Yeah, I, I think I think John and uh, and Mayor Fox, I mean, they, they've highlighted better than I can the benefits of the, of having an aspect that's in person. That is how we as humans relate to one another. And virtual is an artificial format. And yeah, we make it work and it's convenient and there are definite benefits, but it doesn't have that human interaction uh, that I think is essential for a board to move forward on a long-term basis, right? But it's important, I think, to capture the best of both. If you go virtual, those who don't feel comfortable, those who don't want to come in every time because it's a long drive, members of the public that want to come in uh, virtually, they'll be able to do it. And so you capture the best of both. And, and our experience with Brantford is, yeah, it's not perfect and there are mm -hmm. camera angles and things like that, but it, but it achieves the desired purpose and it works pretty well. So the other issue is, you know, I'm giving September because I think it does benefit staff for them to know what it is we hope they can do. Uh, utilizing the best efforts. And if they can't, they can come to us September and say, look, this is the issue. Maybe we can do it in October, November. Uh, so I think it gives them the flexibility, but it gives them a target that uh, we as a board are asking to try and achieve. Thank you. Okay. okay. So it, the consensus that I'm hearing here, and then I'll, is we go with a hybrid meeting, which to me makes sense. That's where we are technologically. We do it locally. In terms of the protocols and bylaws and so forth, that will be part of staff's review of, of getting to the hybrid. I, I'm a little hesitant to tell people what they need to do, come in or not. It may be a little different at a municipal level, but frankly, at the end of the day, each of the members here reports back to the uh, municipalities that they're representing. And, and you know that would be kind of an issue for them to determine if it's okay to be in or out. Um, be, because again, this is, it's not a bunch of local people, right? This is a big distance for a lot of folks. And uh, I think, frankly, everybody, everybody here is a professional and can make that judgment call. However, that said, we probably have to have some parameters or something around it. So that will be part of the discussion uh, in terms of that. And I'm not sure how our bylaws reflect, et cetera. So the motion is on the floor. It's seconded by Brian. And Brian, I'm sorry, you wanted to say something? Well, th thank you, Mayor. Uh Mr. Chair, uh, and, I, and I, I support it fully. Uh, I fully agree with the speakers that have spoken fast, but Mayor Fox has spoken about that council members are supposed to attend. And I did not support the hybrid at our own council, but I did take advantage of it the other night. And I stayed in the field to five to six and then tuned in and got in on the council meeting. So it does work most of the time. Not always perfect. So I, I think and I, I fully agree with Mayor, Mayor Davis is that 
as soon as possible, this can happen. I think it would work better. And I do understand the members that got to travel a long distance. I, I think of my friend Bernie down there at Dunville. He's got a long ways to come. And sometimes you only get there and, it's, and the meeting only lasts an hour. So it can work both ways. Okay. So, um, so it's on the floor. And I think just, uh, just so we're clear, from a staff perspective, that's in the report and this is a, a viable option. So no hiccups to this, correct? Yes. Okay. So then I'm going to just call the question as uh, the motion by Kevin, seconded by Brian, for a hybrid as uh, soon as possible with September being the, the, the target. Uh, any more comments? All in, uh, any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Perfect. Nice discussion. Okay, good. So... And so staff has direction and we'll move forward on that. The next item is human resources policy update. I don't know if there's any comments on that. I'll put the motion on the floor. It's a bit of housekeeping motion that the human resources policy updated update May 27, 2022 be approved and implemented. Can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by Richard, seconded by Guy. Any comments or questions? Anything staff want to add? I see nothing. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Cash and investment status. Motion that report number GM 052242, cash and investment status, April 2022, be received as information. Moved by Joan, seconded by Jerry. Questions, comments? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Financial summary that the financial summary for the period ended April 30, 2022 be approved. Moved by John, seconded by Ian. Comments, questions? Any opposed? It's carried, thank you. Uh, Provincial Offenses Act Officer Designation motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority appoints Joseph Castellan, Jamie Forsland, and Peter Gatto as Provincial Offenses Act officers to enforce section 29 of the Conservation Authorities Act. Moved by Marcus, seconded by Les. Comments, questions? Any opposed? That is carried. Okay, here we uh, motion. I'll put um, so we got the pheasant hunt program. I'll put the motion on the floor. Motion that report number GM 052247, pheasant hunting third party agreement be received for information. Let's get it on the floor and then we'll have a chat. Marcus, moved by Marcus, seconded by Bruce Banbury. Okay, let me just make a note here on the floor. Okay, I'll throw the floor open. The, the report is there. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, just a quick question. We just received a, a letter, I guess. Uh, I, I would imagine everybody has received it now um, from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters in the North American Versatile Hunting Dogs Association. I'm just uh, wondering whether staff has reached out or whether they will reach out to these organizations to uh, to have a conversation with them. And I'm wondering if, if they need uh, this council's direction to do so or whether that would be something that would be automatic in, in lieu of the fact that we've had these discussions already. Maybe staff could answer that. I appreciate it. Sam? Yeah, yeah, so through you, Mr. Chair. So the report that's um, on, we're presenting to you today is just giving you the background in terms of a third party agreement. So depending on what direction we receive from the board today, we would be reaching out to basically all of the um, people who've, who've submitted comments and concerns around um, the program following up after the board meeting. So we don't need direction to reach out to them, but we um, do need to know sort of if the board has any concerns or questions with the information in their report. Okay. So, so basically you got a report there. I think the direction from the board last time we had this up was that they would give us a little more information on the complexity of the issues. And so what's kind of on the table here is if we want to proceed with the pheasant hunting, and I believe some of the folks have made an offer to provide volunteers or some third party input. The question is, do we wish staff to pursue looking at setting up a third party involvement here, which is the way this program would proceed. And there's issues, right? 
we have to decide, like the, the third party people have to let us know if they're willing to participate. There's some legal stuff. So there's a bunch of things in the report. So from today's perspective, this is for information. And the question to the board would be, is there a desire to pursue looking into the option of involving the third party folks and move ahead from there? Uh, that's the way I see it. If somebody sees it differently, maybe let me know. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, along those lines, Chair, I wanted to know from staff, I mean, the recommendation is receive the report, but if that's what we do, then then what happens? Will they then continue to try and come to an arrangement or will they not because of the issues raised in their report? So I'd ask staff if you might just clarify uh, <laughs> what what happens going forward if if all we do is receive the report. Through you, Mr. Chair. So based on our recommendation that was in the hunting program, the operation, we were uh, proposing that the pheasant program um, that ceased in 2019 would continue to not happen. The concerns that were brought to the board were about considering other options and the direction we received from the board was to take a look at whether or not, what were some of the challenges and what were some of the positives in terms of getting into a third party agreement what would be some of the parameters that we would have to consider? So the reason why you don't see a recommendation two or four was we were just providing that information and hopefully seeking direction from the board in terms of whether or not they wanted us to pursue uh, the pheasant program under a third party agreement. So, so does that mean then that if we just receive it that you will not move forward the third party agreement based on the prior resolution? And if the wish of the board is you'd move forward, we would need a specific resolution that effect today. Is that what you're telling that, me? That's correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kevin, for the clarity there. Um, I'm not sure, for, so Joe, I'm just gonna go back to you or, and then I'll get you, Jane. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I would, uh, if it's a motion, and I think Sam had mentioned maybe they didn't need a motion, so I'm just a little bit confused on, on where to go, but if, uh, if uh, staff requires a motion to move forward with at least just the discussions with these uh, groups um, and then come back with a report uh, uh, on how those discussions went, I would be happy to make that motion. I haven't written anything down to have a formal motion, but uh, maybe staff could help me with that if need be. I'm just wondering, do you actually need a motion or can we just give you direction? Uh, through you, Chair White, so um, there, there is a motion on the table to receive this information. So when we resolve that one, it, it could be a separate motion. It could just be staff direction. I suppose I defer to the board on that and whether they feel it's a matter that they would wish to vote on or not. So, okay. All right. Well, it may be a matter. Uh, so we're gonna, we do have a motion to receive for information and Kevin's correct. That's that report. And then that's that. And then we'll see if there's a motion from the floor to pursue looking into a, a third party arrangement and we can craft that. Okay, Joe. Uh, that's that's fine. Yeah. Okay. We'll take the first one and uh, go from there. Okay. Uh, Jane. Yes, I wanted to ask staff, what is the relationship between GRCA and and Ducks Unlimited? Obviously, Trout's Unlimited is just putting fish in the water. You don't have to manage fish that way. But what is the relationship between Ducks and Unlimited? For you, Mr. Chair, is Pam or Beth on the line able to answer that question? Uh, through your, oh, sorry, let me get situated here. Uh, through you, Chair White, our relationship with Ducks and Limited, to to my knowledge, is kind of project specific. Um, so, if there's a particular project, be it at Conestoga Lake or Luther Marsh. Um, it would be kind of project specific. Um, they do sit on um, several steering committees. Um, so that's my knowledge of our relationship um, with Ducks Unlimited. I don't know if Pam has anything further to add on that. Yes, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, it's very much a restoration service base. So it's looking, our relationship with Ducks Unlimited is about the restorations of lands. It's not necessarily, um, directly related to uh, hunting. Okay, thank you. So basically, I guess my question is then, is this new project with the pheasants, That's the, is this new? This is new that an organ, a third party organization would actually run the project and look after 
what's going on with with the pheasants. They would put the pheasants out. They would, um, you know, uh, look after who's hunting that kind of thing, rather than Ducks Unlimited, which is you know restoring wetlands and and so on, so that they can hunt. Does that make sense? Through you, Mr. Chair. So yes, we would be looking for a third party to manage the pheasant hunting program on GRCA property. And we don't have anything like that right now. We stopped it in 2019. Yeah, we stopped like us, like the GRCA doing it. Yes, in 2019. But do we have anything that's third party that's similar to this? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, not from a hunting perspective, but we do have multiple third party agreements for use of our properties for various activities. I think some of the challenges we generally don't have, we don't offer a program and then have a third party person also delivering a program on the same property. We try to stay away from that. Okay. So in this case, we would have a third party person delivering the, uh, delivering the particular thing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Whale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, my apologies for being a little bit late. I got a new computer and it took me about half an hour before it would let me in to, uh, to join you. So uh, I also have an electric car and it's like having a big computer. So you, when you're talking earlier about there's no problem with getting to meetings if you have an electric vehicle, uh, that could still be a problem too. But this, this question is more towards an article I saw in a local paper about supporters of the Grand that were restocking trout, brown trout in the Grand River in the uh, Alora Fergus or above the Shan Dam, I believe. Do we have an agreement with them or how does that program work? Do they look after stocking and then monitoring the catch and release or policing the catch and release? Uh, what, what, uh, what's the relationship between ourselves and that group? Pam, are you able to answer that question? Sure. So Sometimes in conservation areas, we, um, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, sometimes in conservation areas, we do have um, MNRF coming in to help us stock or Trouts Unlimited stock. But with the nature of fish, once the products are put into the river, there's no telling where they're going to go. So they could end up staying in the lake at Bellwood. They could go down and through the dam and go out into the, the creek or through the rest of the river and the Grand. So it's, it's a little bit different with a pheasant stocking program. The birds aren't gonna get up and fly around. They really stay localized. And it's not like um, fish where it could be 80 kilometers difference of where they start to where they end up. The, these birds would really be um, local to that one portion of property. So it's a little bit different. And no, um, I do believe that they do some other uh, work down the river of looking at the trout but it's not um, exactly where they put it in because you can't keep the fish in that area. So it's a little different. I see you put your name in in large caps, Bruce. Are you yelling at us because you're mad at your computer? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Joe, I'm going to go back to you. Uh, just, just a comment. So the reports there, there are complications if we, if, if we proceed with this. If we just receive the initial report for information and don't proceed, then, th then that's it. Um, remembering in 2019, there was a board, uh, uh, the program was stopped. And, um, so, um, let me go, let me take the initial motion and get that off the table and then we'll move to Jane. Did you have something on the initial motion or, um, yeah, I just, I just had a, another question, which is, sure. Go ahead. Can people, can people set up a uh, pheasant hunting on private land like they do in, in, uh, in Great Britain, where they have it, they have all their all on the Lord's land. Can people set up pheasant hunting on private land? Is that allowed in Ontario? I don't know is if that's a question. That sounds like a legal question to me. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it is done through a permit from the um, Ministry of Natural Resources. So it, it is possible. It's just via permit. Okay, great. Thanks. It's a legacy of the empire, Jane. Okay. Yeah, I know. So um, I'm going to put this, John, I know your hand's up, but I'm going to come back to you because I think you're going to bring something forward. So yep. yeah, that's fine. motion that report number 
GM 05247 pheasant hunting third party agreement be received as information. That's already on the floor. I can't remember who, but I know staff does. Any um, further comments or questions on this? Any opposed? Sorry, Joan? Are you? Thank you. I did have one um, comment, Mr. Chair, question. Sure. Quickly, um, we stopped the pheasant program in 2019. Um, can staff refresh my memory why we stopped it? Were we having problems? Um, was it liability issues? Uh, Sam? Yeah, Pam, if I can get you to respond Pam? to that, please. Sure, through you, Mr. Chair. I'm having the mute and unmute challenges myself. Um, it was primarily based, Joan, on um, staff resources. It, we were looking at the Conservation Authorities Act. We were looking at the availability of um, priorities and things that we had to do inside the conservation areas. And because we have such limited staff in all of the locations, we look to our responsibilities of water management, running the conservation area, assisting with the cottage lots at Lake, at Conestogo Lake, um, assisting with property and hunting and the hunting program was further on down the list of priorities. The hunting program itself, meaning deer hunting, turkey hunting, and all those other activities are less labor intensive than pheasant hunting. So that was the piece of the program that was carved off to say we no longer have the resources, staff resources to support this piece, but we can still offer all of these other pieces of the hunting program and be able to meet our commitments for our other priorities like water management and the conservation area function itself. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing further, any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Uh, Joe? Yeah, so what I'll do is um, use the same verbiage actually that, uh, that we received from uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and the North American Hunting Dog Association. And basically uh, I'll make this motion, um, bear with me, uh, that the board uh, be guided to, that the board guide GRCA staff to engage the OF and a OF -A -H -N the NAVHDA, oh wow, OGR, in meaningful discussions about possible solutions to the board's ultimate decision on the future of the pheasant program, uh, uh, so that the board is informed as it can be, as it, as is informed as it can be. So I, I'm making that motion. If it gets second, I just speak to it briefly. I I, I just don't think it's um, less uh, a second. Can I just sorry, Joe? Can I just ask for some clarity though? Um, and I, I see what you're doing there, but based on the report, it seems to me that the option in the report is to ask staff to investigate a third party arrangement. Um, your motion sounds like you want to start the discussions from the beginning and talk to this specific group. Isn't it? The path forward seems to be we need a third party arrangement. Yes, but so we should you? we could talk with these two groups because I, I would assume that those uh, would be potentially the third party. So I'm not excluding them. That's not what I mean. I'm just suggesting that maybe discuss, maybe you want to be a little more generic, direct staff to speak to interested parties or something, because are they the only groups involved? As far as I know, um, you know, we could expand it. I don't mind expanding it to any other um, interested party. So, so sorry, staff, I'm just looking for some clarity here. I, it's a fairly controversial topic. I want to make sure that we don't do this this week and then next week we didn't talk to Sam down the street. So I think the, the, the so I'm not trying to interfere with your motion, Joe, and it's certainly That's there. Fine. I just want to make That's sure fine. we get some clarity. Um, would, would, and it doesn't really talk about looking into third party arrangements. It's, it sounds like it's a, we can, we're starting from the beginning and going back and talking to these folks when I think we've, we're a long way down the road to, if we're going to proceed, it needs to be third party. And if we do the third party, we need to speak to these folks, right? That's right. So can we modify that to say direct staff to speak to th uh, third parties interested in um, continuing the program, something like that. Is that all? Yeah, well, that's fine. I mean, we don't have to specify. Um, 
uh, it's just that these two organizations are probably the more likely ones to be interested. But so uh, we, we'll, we, we could expand it. Sure. So we will absolutely speak to those groups. I'm just wondering if you want to list. I just thought if it was a little more generic, we will speak to third party groups around an arrangement, which will include your, your group there. OK. Yeah, no, that works. That, that okay. works just as well. So I'll make I'll make that motion. If, if it's seconded, we can okay. uh, probably discuss further. So the motion. Okay. Uh, go ahead. So can I just can I just make a, a, a slight suggestion uh, from the wording that you had said, Chris, uh, that the board direct staff to speak to third parties interested in operating the program as opposed to continuing the program since we did discontinue it a couple of years. Is that it? So just uh, switch the word continuing to operating. Right. That's fine. So <laughs> to them doing the program, not continuing. So you, you good with that, Joe? Are I am. Honest? You seconded that. Are we meeting all the legal rules here with this? OK. So there's the motion on the floor, basically to direct staff to see if we can come to a third party arrangement. And frankly, I'm thinking if we can't, then that's 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 that. Um, but we'll, we'll deal with that when it comes back. So are there any further co any comments on this motion or anything else? So I will ask the question all opposed to the motion that Joe presented. I have a question. I've got a question. Sure. Go ahead, Kevin. So I want to understand the implications of the this uh, this resolution so to staff so this would direct you to have those discussions with whatever group's interested and and if you does this then mean that you would then do you see this authority to then enter into such an agreement and not come back to the board or would it be you discuss figure what can be done if something can be done and then it would come back to the board for final approval uh, my, my, I'll let Steph out, but my interpretation would be it absolutely has to come back to the board. Absolutely. Because again, there are people who support and people who don't support, et cetera. All we're trying to do is we had a pheasant program. It was terminated. Some folks would like to get it back. We're saying we can't do it on our own. We need third party. The third party may not even be able to meet the requirements or, or there may be other issues. The, they need to then come back and say, here's the implication for the board. Are you in favor of signing a third party deal? So it's a good question, and it will absolutely come back. I'm correct. Sam and Karen, yes? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. So that motion is on the floor. I'm just sorry, going to ask again. Any opposed? All right. That is carried. Thank you very much. Okay. Moving right along uh, to 12.8, Natural Heritage. Motion that report number GM 05-2749, Natural Heritage Program Update, be received as information. Moved by Richard, seconded by Catherine. Also, Comments or questions? There's a presentation, actually. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm so excited about the last thing. I've lost my way. So I'll turn the floor over. Hey, Sanger is off. Crystal, are you? Yeah, great, great, thank you. Yep, I can see the presentation, wonderful. All right, um, so good morning, Chair White and members of the board. Uh, it's a pleasure to share with you this morning an update on GRC's Natural Heritage Program. Uh, the report and presentation uh, is gonna highlight activities and services being undertaken uh, by the GRCA to enhance, restore, and protect the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. Next slide, please. So the Grand River watershed uh, has a diverse natural heritage of rivers, lakes, forests, wetlands, grasslands that provide habitat to thousands of species of birds, fish, animals, plants, and other creatures. <clears throat> this network of interconnected natural areas provides many ecosystem services which support the health and well being of our local communities, including clean water soil erosion, flood moderation, and recreation opportunities to name a few. The Grand River Watershed's natural heritage system is comprised of key natural features, including more than 100,000 hectares of forests, 60,000 hectares of wetlands, and 11,000 kilometers of rivers and tributaries. Next slide, please. The Natural Heritage Program works with other GRCA departments, municipalities, agencies, indigenous communities, landowners, and the public to promote and implement environmental practices that will enhance, restore, or protect the watershed's aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. 
This is achieved through the development of watershed scale plans, natural heritage input to planning and permit reviews, and conservation projects on lands managed by the GRCA. These initiatives support GRCA's strategic objectives to improve watershed health, manage land holdings in a responsible and sustainable way, and connect people to the environment through outdoor experiences. Next slide, please. Several of the watershed scale plans that are helping to inform GRCA's conservation work include the Grand River Natural Heritage System Framework, the Grand River Fisheries Management Plan, and the Watershed Forest Plan for the Grand River. In early 2021, a report summarizing the phase one characterizations and sub-watershed analysis from the Natural Heritage System Framework was presented to the board. The next phase of this plan will examine the contribution of GRCA lands to the watershed's natural heritage system and support the development of strategies and recommended actions that relate to the conservation and management of lands owned by the GRCA. We're also initiating an update to the watershed forest plan, including options to report on watershed forest health. Next slide, please. The Natural Heritage Program and our ecologists support the Resource Planning Department in the review of development and construction proposals to determine their potential impact on natural features, such as streams, wetlands, and other potential natural hazards. In many cases, this review includes pre-consultation meetings and site visits, an evaluation of background and impact studies, identification of concerns, or discuss other changes to reduce the impact of the work. These reviews help ensure compliance with the provincial policy statement, municipal official plan policies, and address natural heritage systems and wetland and watercourse policies administered under the Conservation Authorities Act. In 2021, GRCA ecologists, ecologists completed 342 reviews, including permits in accordance with Ontario Reg 150.06, and planning files as per our MOUs with watershed municipalities. Next slide, please. These next several slides will highlight some of the ecological restoration and conservation management being coordinated by the Natural Heritage Program. The GRCA owns a total of approximately 11,500 hectares of forested lands. The 10-year forest management plan is an important element in the ongoing management of these forested lands and is a requirement of the Managed Forest Tax Incentive Program. Complementary to this plan is GRCA's Forest Plantation Master Plan. This rolling five-year operating plan aims to coordinate the necessary long-term plantation restoration activities with GRCA's primary objective being the conversion of these planted forests to more diverse to a more species diverse forest ecosystem. In our 2021-22 operating period, conifer plantation thinning was completed at three properties totaling 50 hectares. Our program's watershed forester also coordinates several monitoring and treatment projects in response to impacts from forest invasive species, such as emerald ash borer and spongy moth, also recently known as the LDD moth. The other component of forest management on GRCA lands is tree planting, and this can serve to increase forest cover or replace trees that have been lost due to invasive species. Next slide. Wetlands are one of the most diverse habitats in the watershed and provide many ecosystem services for our communities. However, the watershed has lost approximately two thirds of its wetlands since the 1800s. The GRCA has reestablished wetlands in areas such as Luther Marsh Wildlife Management Area, Dunville Marsh, and Tequanya Conservation Area. The Natural Heritage Program continues to guide the implementation, management, monitoring, and partnerships that help sustain such areas. One significant threat to the health and biodiversity of our watershed's wetlands is invasive Phragmites. Natural Heritage staff continue to assess the impacts of Phragmites at Tequanya Conservation Area, and in 2021, implemented follow-up treatments on eight hectares of restored wetland habitat and in areas of endangered Virginia mallow. 
At Luther Marsh, we took our monitoring efforts to new heights and piloted drone technology to complete a 73 hectare survey for Phragmites, along with two days of land-based treatments on known patches. Next slide, please. Today, only a fraction of native grassland communities exist on the watershed's landscape. The Natural Heritage Program leads the creation and enhancement of more than 345 hectares of grassland habitat throughout the watershed on GRCA-owned properties. These grassland communities provide valuable habitat to the numerous flora and fauna species that are reliant on grasslands for survival. In addition, along with our forests and wetlands, grassland habitats play an important role in carbon storage and sequestration to help combat climate change. In 2021, through a funding partnership with the Grassland Stewardship Initiative, 24 hectares at Luther Marsh was field cut to maintain its grassland character characteristics and 11 hectares at Guelph Lake Conservation Area is in the process of being converted to native grassland vegetation. Bird monitoring and vegetation surveys help inform our planning and management actions for these areas. Next slide, please. The Grand River and its tributaries are the link between the landscape's natural areas. The health of the watersheds, rivers and streams is reflected in the aquatic ecosystems they sustain. The Natural Heritage Program undertakes projects to improve aquatic habitats on GRCA lands and at times with watershed partners. Staff also contribute to increasing knowledge of aquatic species distribution and in 2021 conducted five days of freshwater mussel surveys on Grand River tributaries to, su to supplement fisheries and Oceans Canada data. Paused in 2020 and 2021 due to the pandemic, we are very much looking forward to welcoming back the Mill Creek Stewardship Ranger crew this summer in partnership with the Friends of Mill Creek. The Natural Heritage Program delivers this summer youth experience and mentors a small crew of students on stream restoration and watershed conservation. Next slide, please. Like many of GRCA's programs and services, the Natural Heritage Program is an integrated component of watershed management and staff assist across multiple program areas. For example, when GRCA is upgrading infrastructure, natural heritage staff help screen for ecological concerns and provide input on plans and mitigation measures. We also work with property and conservation areas to identify emerging opportunities for ecological restoration or enhancing natural features. Many of our projects are externally funded, so developing relationships with partners and the community is crucial. In 2021, Several funding proposals were developed and submitted to federal programs seeking financial resources to support continued conservation planning and on the ground activities. This work, along with that of other GRCA programs and our watershed partners, is building resilience into the watershed to help address a changing climate and the loss of biodiversity. And with that, if I could have the next slide, please. I would like to thank you, Chair, and members of the board for providing time today to share an update on the Natural Heritage Program. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, Crystal, thank you very much. That was a fantastic report. Um, nice to see all that stuff. So we'll uh, throw it out to the floor, Catherine. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and through you, thank you, Crystal. It was a, a very thorough um, presentation. And I think it's a good reminder of how much managed forest we have, how many um, uh, hectares of, of natural heritage systems that we have that we're responsible for. We often forget about that if we're just talking about kind of the, the river area. My question was around Phragmites. It's continuing to be a real effort. Um, back in 2017, 2018, area, I think that there was a pilot project over a couple of real significant uh, Phragmites uh, growth area in Long Point, and I think uh, also uh, near the Chatham border. 
what are we doing now and what is the uh, treatment that's being used on Phragmites? And uh, kudos to using drone technology to find some of the areas that uh, are not visible by any road or path for this real invasive species. Uh, through you, Chair White. Um, so we've, we've managed Phragmites on a couple of our properties, um, but understanding that it is a wide ranging issue um, across our watershed. So we have a couple factors when we look at sort of where to target our efforts. Um, right now we're targeting sort of Tequanya, um, Luther, because it's an early response on those properties. And we know that the work that we can implement there can have an impact. We've got resources, um, both through funding and through staff on those sites. So we've done a couple different techniques. We typically hire contractors um, and have done a herbicide application in those areas. In places like um, Tequanya, where we're working around an endangered plant species, um, we've actually worked with our contractors um, to cut stems and actually do an injection, which is a little more intense, but it actually also um, helps ensure protection around um, endangered plant species as well um, in those areas. We are actually pursuing um, an application um, recently approved was around overwater applications um, of a herbicide for Phragmites. So we've actually are we're pursuing some conversations with the province right now in terms of if that would be um, applicable to some work that we would like to do up at Luther and getting some feedback from the ministry on if, if that would be a suitable or a feasible option up at Luther. So we've, we've approached it from a couple of different ways. Um, yeah, and it is like you said, it is a wide ranging issue across our watershed. Thanks very much. All right, uh, Richard, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the hand is kind of light. It's hard to see. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll change it to the darker one next time. Uh, <laughs> Crystal, excellent report. I really uh, appreciate that report, especially the PowerPoint. I'm reading through it. I appreciate reading through it, but the PowerPoint really brought it to light. Uh, but I've, I'm, the, my question is on uh, is the federal government and the provincial government have designated the Grand River as a heritage river. So does the work that we're doing have any relationship to that designation as a heritage river? And if so, are there grants that we're able to get as a result of that being designated as the Heritage River? And a follow-up question, is there a risk of us losing the designation of the Grand River as Heritage River? I know that's a lot there, thanks. Yeah. Um, through you, Chair, I may actually defer that question. I think there's probably others in the meeting that may know more than, than I do. Um, I believe it's a cultural um, heritage designation. So I might defer to another staff member if somebody would like to speak to that. Thanks, Crystal. I can speak to that. So the designation, Crystal's right, the designation um, that the Heritage River has is based on cultural or human um, heritage. So Crystal's program doesn't actually touch on that aspect. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that answers your question completely, Richard, or not. No, no, you have. One's okay. culture, one's natural heritage. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Warren? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, thank you, Chair White and, and Crystal. An excellent presentation. Um, I like. You're, you're breaking up a little there, Warren. I don't know why. I've got to know. I don't want to meet in person. <laughs> <laughs> Come on down. We'll wait for you. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know why I've got the, uh, the issue with the, the sound. I don't know. You sound um, better. With, okay. I'm going to go to Marcus, and we'll come back to you, Warren, to yeah, see if things have cleared up. Okay, Mar uh, Marcus, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Through your chair, um, Crystal. Great presentation. I really appreciated it. Uh, I'm just curious if some of the ecological implications you look at would be for uh, projects like the pheasant hunting program that we're going to talk to some of those third party groups with. Uh, I'm just kind of curious if that's what you work on as well. Even looking at you know, moving forward, if we do continue that program, would we look at trying to avoid like lead shot used by hunters to that would, you know, maybe contaminate some of the water and some of the fish species and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I'll, I'll maybe also defer to, to Beth and Pam here, but I, I can't say that we do. Um, we do support our other program areas in a, in a number of different ways um, in terms of their op in terms of operations 
and ecological considerations. Um, one project that we worked on this past, uh, past year was around um, sort of best management practices in terms of some of our mowing along um, our trail areas and vegetation management around those. So that's just a, another example in terms of some of the guidance that we give um, or can provide to our program areas. Um, and um, I guess I, I would look to, to Beth and, and Pam if, if they saw that um, going down the road, um, if there was a, a need there. Okay, thanks Beth or Pam, um, any thoughts? Sure, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we do consider all sorts of different kinds of things when we're looking in the conservation areas and um, the natural heritage and ecological restoration that we can do. And, you know, we've, you've probably um, caught the subtle shift of how we're starting to refer to our parks now as conservation areas. And it's a word and a phrasing that we're using. So it's representing to us this um, return to the things that... Um, have made our conservation areas such a priority and such a welcoming space. So we're integrating it in with our daily practices. We're making those conscientious decisions to have um, more consultation with Crystal's department to uh, looking to plan out our campsites. And so still meeting the needs of our customers and our users, but certainly <coughs> injecting that ecological conservation experiences or opportunities wherever we can. So. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Crystal. All right, Marcus, thank you. Joan, and then I'll get back to Warren. Go ahead, Joan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Crystal, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, the Phragmites led me to think about the giant hogweed plant. And um, I'm wondering, <laughs> do we have a lot of that on our GRCA properties, because I know that's the only place we actually treat it. Um, how is that going? Um, sorry, through, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you're correct in, um, that we do treat for my understanding is, and it's, uh, it would be a, another program area that um, does the treatment of giant hogweed. Um, but I, I do understand that that is treated um, on our lands. I don't know the, the scope or in terms of uh, the amount that gets treated um, in over the years. Um, but I know that that, that that has occurred on our lands. Yeah, we had a presentation at uh, the board um, by Mr. Kemp a few months back and um, I hadn't heard a lot other than a lot of municipalities, I think, are concerned about it and how um, it spreads down the river and so forth. Um, but thank you. And um, who's who's responsible for that at the GRCA? Um, I, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe it is our operations department. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, Joan, thank you. And uh, Warren, do you want to give it another shot? Give us another try. There you go. Um, yeah, thank you, Crystal. If we don't have a natural environment that is sustainable, we don't have a watershed that works. Uh, I think what we are doing as a GRCA is very, very important. I encourage anything that we can do to support the staff and the programs that we have. Um, I think too that we need to get the public more engaged and I don't know what your department does in terms of making presentations such as the one you gave to us this morning about um, the role of the natural heritage component. Uh, sorry, uh, through you Chair White, I can, I can touch on that a little bit. Um, so we do provide, um, we, we do get numerous requests um, from groups in, in the watershed that are interested in presentations. Um, again, it's um, sort of an, uh, integrated across program areas. So if you look at things like our nature centers, um, there's a lot of messaging out there around, around our natural environment. If you look to our conservation services program, um, working on stewardship with our rural landowners, they hold a series of webinars um, and, and do presentations at workshops as well. Um, we go out to community groups and provide presentations. Um, I've 
a, a couple um, recently um, have been occurring in the watershed. And that, that public engagement piece, it, it has been a challenge over the last couple of years um, with the pandemic and, co and COVID, um, but we've just had to be more creative, I think, about that. You know, I think we've tried to um, provide more information through social media and engage people that way. Um, but, but yes, public engagement and just in, and that understanding and making those connections um, is, is really valuable and important um, to the understanding as well. I'd agree. Very good. Yeah. And I think we got so many more new people moving into our watershed who don't know anything about what we do and who we are. And I think that's very, very important. Congratulations to you and all the staff that get out into the field. Thanks, Warren. Uh, we'll go to Sue and then I'm going to... Uh... Do the motion. Go ahead, Sue. Thank you. Just a really quick comment uh, back to Joan and the giant hogweed. You probably won't see a lot of it yet because it hasn't come into fruition. So people haven't treated it yet because they don't recognize it yet. They don't see it yet. All right, Sue, thank you. So uh, I have a motion. Oh, sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, Bruce Will. Oh, sorry, Bruce. My apologies, sir. Don't... No, that's quite all right. I. I have never been able to find my hand that I can push on that button. So you have to watch the screen. If you could just uh, sit with your hand through. up like that, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've only got one to put up, so <laughs> you have to be careful. Um, two, two questions. Is the Natural Heritage Program considered one of our mandatory, or is it going to fit into the mandatory sector of the new regulations? And then I'd be interested to know, Crystal, how successful you've been with the treatment or eradication of it. I know I, I uh, started trying to grow a buffer along a little stream that we have on our property. And I thought I had a wonderful new variety of, of uh, 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 a bamboo species. And I think I figured out it's Phragmites. And I, I found it's a, a tough one to get rid of. Uh, it seems that uh, re reappear from rhizomes and you're continually battling with it, but have you been more successful or fairly successful with your treatment methods? Uh, through you, Chair White, I'll, I can respond to yeah, the, the Phragmites treatment question. Um, and then I think I'd maybe look to Sam to respond to in terms of where we fit in the programs and services. So what we have learned is that Phragmites does take multiple follow-up treatments. Um, we have seen um, at places like Tequanya and where we're doing that early response at Luther before it does become established, um, we are seeing those treatments to be effective, but that is part of our planning consideration is to know that we will need to plan in those areas um, to go in, you know, a second or third year to sort of do that cleanup or mop up treatment, just by nature of, of the plant and how aggressive it is. Um, and then I think we will just need to, we'll need to develop um, an understanding that it probably wouldn't be a full eradication um, on properties and there'll always be patches that pop up, but it's where, where we're gonna have sort of that level or that marker of when it starts to be impactful and where it's not as impactful on the properties. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Sue, is that a legacy? No, just a quick question to uh, our comment to Bruce and, and whoever can't raise your hand. If you go along the bottom in the black area under Zoom, you'll see the word reactions. Do you see the word reactions? If you click on reactions, you will see it says lower hand and raise hand, and that's how you do it. Thank you, Chair. He's trained. Send him an invoice. Okay. So getting back to, back to the motion, that report number GM 05-2749, Natural Heritage Program update be received as information moved by Marcus, second by Catherine. Uh, and am I missing something? Oh, he's got a, oh, there you go, Bruce. Any opposed? Sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Karen? Uh, we actually already had a move, mover and a seconder for that. Oh, but, um, I apologize. Was, uh, no, but Bruce had asked a question about the whether the Natural Heritage Program was part of the mandatory programs and services that had not yet been answered. Okay. Who's going yeah. to answer? Sorry, through you, Mr. Chair. So there are elements of the Natural Heritage Program. So any activities that take place on GRCA property falls under the mandatory programs and services under the land management component. 
That being said, there are some activities that the Natural Heritage Group do provide, um, particularly through the planning function that we have. Um, so a category two agreement will be required for them to fulfill the role in terms of commenting on natural heritage comments um, under the Planning Act, um, which is right now, currently we have MOUs with a number of municipalities regarding our role in planning, and this is an element that is covered. However, moving into the new regulations, commenting on planning applications from a natural heritage per perspective would be a category two program and service. So for the planning function, we, would, we will have to get an agreement with the municipalities to fulfill that element of the plan review. Okay, Bruce. Thank you. All right. So we have a mover and seconder the first time. Um, I'm going to ask if there are any opposed to the motion. That is carried. Thank you. So we all good there, Karen? Am I, am I uh, squared away? Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, thanks. Okay, so we're moving on to current watershed conditions. Does Dwight have anything for us today? No, oh, no major updates uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Certainly uh, our reservoir filling is proceeding as expected. Um, we had some warmer conditions earlier this month and we quickly went from saturated conditions on the landscape to dry conditions. Uh, so now we're just monitoring conditions in the re reservoirs and, and the river and, and operating appropriately. We obviously had a very severe wind event this past weekend. Um, I am following up with Environment Canada because what I think it's uncovered is some issues when we have communication disruptions and the delivery of weather warnings. Um, so we're trying to, to understand that a bit better and uh, we'll certainly encourage uh, Environment Canada to, uh, to have a look into that, um, just so that uh, we're ensuring that the weather warnings get out uh, appropriately. But there was disruption because of, I expect disruption to the cell network with the high winds. Um, so, you know, that vulnerability really needs to be uh, understood a bit better and uh, hopefully some staff at Environment Canada will look into that. Uh, I'll take any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, anything from the board? Okay. I have a motion that- Kevin. Uh, sorry, Kev. I... Go Thanks. ahead, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, All these yellow backgrounds just confusing yeah, me. Sorry about that. And I was a little late on the, the uptake, but uh, Dwight, since you raised it, uh, we're in particular talking about that unfortunate tragedy at, at Pinehurst Lake. And something that I was told is that um, in the event of something like that, and if you're in a forested area and you have a choice between a tent or a trailer in your car, you should shelter in your car because it's more structurally robust and designed to take that, those kinds of hits, or at least hits from other vehicles. So do we, do we give that warning or that advice to our, our campers and trailers that uh, if there is such a storm coming, they should probably preferably shelter in their vehicles? I don't know if that's for, maybe I'm wrong, or maybe that what I was told is wrong, but anyways, I have that if question. I may, if I may, Kevin, excuse me, yeah, forgive me. Um, our neighbor's car was crushed. So yeah. if they were in a car, it would have been crushed as well. So I don't think in this situation, anything would have helped. Yeah. Concrete, maybe a concrete building. Do we have concrete buildings at, at Piners? I don't think we really do. Through you, Mr. Chair, possibly Pam wants to, to respond to this. However, I know Pam has already held a debriefing session with her staff. Any of these sort of events, uh, we certainly um, reflect on them and try to learn uh, what we can do better, and uh, obviously, safety of our patrons in our park is a very high priority. So, possibly Pam wants to comment. Can I? Sorry, Pam. Before before you answer, I'm just gonna, if you don't mind, um, I, I just put a note of caution out there. Every situation is different. Every storm is different. Every building, tree, car is different. I'd be very hesitant for us to be giving this kind of advice in a public way around that not that there isn't some generic responses to it but i think we need to be cautious that we don't say here's exactly what you do in this situation in case that fails but that's just it may be more of a legal question 
but yeah, yeah, I'd say, Chris, so, you know, I agree with you, but I ask you because I was several members of the public asked me. So. Oh, no, no, it's a it's yeah. a fair question. Absolutely. And it would be great if we had a standard answer. I'm just saying yeah. we need to be cautious because if we give an answer and it's incorrect in a certain circumstance, we we do have a potential issue. So was Pam going to did you want to oh. say hello? Yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, we do have a liability kind of waiver when you enter into the park and talks about the parks and natural area and that um, as part of our literature that we produced and on our website, we talk about what to do in the event of a storm in natural areas. Um, and part of what makes Pinehurst and our conservation area so beautiful is all of the trees. And so there is that expectation a bit that when you're entering into a natural area, it's going to have trees and it's going to have water and it's going to have um, those open spaces. And so, well, we don't um, we, certainly if we were asked, we would encourage people to go to our washroom buildings, um, you know, to get into their car, to go into a parking lot, an area that avoids things. But on a, in an area when there's sometimes two, three thousand people inside the park, we look at it and say, um, you know, we, we manage things in the best way that we can. And in the event of a storm, seek shelter uh, where we can. And it is so unfortunate that um, the tree happened to fall in the way that it did on um, on last Saturday. It's, it's just an unfortunate accident. And there's no way of um, predicting that kind of, uh, that kind of an outcome in a storm. So it's just, uh, I'm, our hearts go out to the staff and to the families that were affected and we have uh, great empathy and compassion for all of that. And there was a lot of first responders that came to support the park operations that day. And it was just a really, um, really sad outcome of an unfortunate, um, unexpected weather event. And uh, panel, I appreciate those comments and I know the board shares them. It was a, it was a terrible incident. Kevin, did you have something further? Yeah, glad to hear that we kind of do a, sort of a deed the staff and uh, do kind of a debrief after it's like this to determine what can be, if anything can be done to, um, uh, you know, in, in even a future events. But a totally unrelated question, again, coming to me from a member of the public. And, you know, periodically we, we get uh, notices of spills up river from Brantford. And so we close, uh, we take our drinking water from the river and then we close the, the doors to our canal until the Bill, whatever it is, has passed. Uh, someone asked me, what about people who actually use the river, and in particular those that might swim or might float down the river and floats and are in and out of their float? And is there any concern for those users in the event of uh, something like that? And is there a system for notification to the public? Okay, thanks, Dwight. You look. Um... I would not say there is a formal um, framework in place for what you're speaking about, um, but typically those are minor spills. If there was a significant spill to the river um, that was more raw um, or posed a more human health risk, then we would work with MECP to, to try to get a broader uh, notification out. But uh, typically, uh, you know, some of the bypasses from the sewage treatment plants um, are very minor spills. So it, it would depend on the nature of the spill. And um, if necessary, we have communications departments to make um, public aware. But it's not a, a normal practice. Fortunately, we don't get um, really serious spills to the river. But it would be gauged based on the severity of the event, I think, would be the corporate response there. And we'd work with community emergency uh, coordinators and that sort of thing in an event like that. Obviously, there'd have to be coordination with um, municipal response services also. Thanks very much, Joy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, Kevin, thank you. Um, I believe the motion's on... Uh, sorry? I believe the motion's on the floor. Um... I don't believe we yet have a mover or seconder. Yeah, I just keep getting these backwards. Okay, moved by John, seconded by Les. Anything further? Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dwight. Appreciate it. Um, Warren, how's your... Uh, we're going to go to a little other business, and then we've got a, a closed item. 
Um, how's your technology, Warren? I'll, I'll get I'm, the... I'm mute here. Can you hear me? Yep, you sound good. I'll, I'll get oh, the floor to you. Well, here's a, here's a couple of good news. Um, other business items. Two weeks ago today was Friday the 13th. I had a couple of options. One was to go to Port Dover on my motorcycle, which I don't have, or go to um, Drayton to the Historical Society meet, meeting of uh, Mapleton Township Historical Society, and they were hosting uh, a presentation by Bob Stannard, one of the local residents. And he was talking about the construction of the Conestoga Dam in the 1950s. Very engaging. There were over 200 people in attendance on a Friday night. And um, he engaged the people because a lot of them were from that area. A lot of them were cottagers who didn't have a good history of the of the Conestoga Lake Dam and construction project. So he really did a very, very active, um, engaging, engaging um, presentation. Uh, I want to thank the, the Historical Society for keeping the local history alive in, in, in Mapleton and Peel. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful evening. So tomorrow, uh, or tonight and tomorrow, if you are looking for something to do, having not been out for two years, you can go to the new Hamburg Fairgrounds, and you may even see Mayor Les Armstrong wandering the fairgrounds. And uh, Les, do you have anything to say about what's happening tonight and tomorrow? Well, the only thing I would uh, say to people is that uh, it starts at uh, approximately 8.30 in the morning, and we always, I always suggest people bring their deep pockets because I like to remind them that it's a fundraiser, not a, not a money-making proposition, and that the MCC provide an awful lot of help to a lot of people all around the world. So um, as far as I know, apparently it's going to be kind of a hybrid operation because they will have some, uh, allow some bidding uh, over the internet. So, but it's expected to be uh, quite a great return to uh, uh, a great project for the, the local people and for the Mennonite Central Committee. And uh, I was informed today that uh, a regional councillor, Jim Erb, and his wife have a, a booth set up. So they'll be selling you hamburgers so you can go and see the, the unofficial mayor of uh, Herbsville um, tomorrow morning as well. So um, there's lots of opportunities to enlighten yourselves and uh, actually pick up something that's pretty comfy for some of those cold days that we do have. So lots of great uh, quilts uh, available for sale. So come out and enjoy. Thanks, Les. Thank you, Les, for that. And Warren, thank you for those items. Appreciate it. So now um, I think we're prepared to go into closed here. I have a motion that the general membership enter a closed meeting in accordance with the Municipal Act Section 239 for the following purposes, labor relations or employee negotiations. Uh, moved by Marcus, second by Sue. Uh, any opposed? Uh, we are going into closed and I'll report. Are we good? Yes, we're live again. All right, I want to welcome everyone back. We have nothing to report out except uh, we need to approve the minutes of the previous closed session. So I have a motion that the minutes of the previous closed session be approved as circulated. Moved by Sue, seconded by Ian. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank everybody for a great meeting. Um, we'll uh, see you all in June. Keep safe and uh, carry on. Motion to adjourn. Uh, sorry, motion to adjourn <laughs> by Guy, Guy and Marcus. And none opposed, thanks. No, sorry, any opposed. <laughs> <laughs> I can leave this meeting and going for the next, till the next one, right? Okay, anyway, thank you, everyone. We'll see you so soon. Safe drive home.